Okay, so it's it's eleven thirty now, so we'll start now. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we have uh, a great seminar for you here today. Uh, this is being presented by Michael Appleton, uh, and this is on um, uh, for your mindset, uh, improving your mindset in real estate. So it's great for the new year. Um, I'll introduce Michael, and then I'll let him take it away. Um, Michael Appleton has distinguished himself as the top real estate trainer across Canada with three major real estate corporations. His list of clientele reads like a who's who of real estate, including Remax, Royal LePage, Home Life, Century 21, Chestnut Park, and the Toronto Real Estate Board. He's now joined us as an agent at our brokerage international realty firm, so we're happy to have him. Uh, he's empowered thousands of realtors across the country for the last 20 years. <clears throat> Michael has served on the board of directors for RICO from 2012 to 2021, and is the only person in history of Canadian real estate to win the Real Estate Institute of Canada's Morgard Literary Award four times. Michael's book, Dialogues to Success, can be ordered online at realestatelanguage.com. Okay, so without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Michael. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Kyle just mentioned, the title of the session is Improving Your Mindset in Real Estate Sales. So it's not so much about systems or strategy technique. It's more about uh, trying to wash away the cobwebs in our head, uh, the, uh, the mental apprehensions, uh, uh, the little mental foibles that uh, we deal with on a daily basis being in the arena of commission sales. Uh, we're going to pack in as much as we can over the next hour. And the way I'd like to approach it, I'll lecture for the hour going through the slides. Uh, expanding on ideas. And then at the end of the hour, we can have about 20 minutes or so where I'll be glad to answer questions. If you feel through the hour of the lecture, there's something critical you'd like to ask if you just type it into chat. Uh, Kyle, we'll see if it's uh, prevalent and uh, interject to uh, mention something that you want to address at the time. Otherwise, if you can leave the questions till the end, uh, that would be fine. Now, as I address these mental hiccups that we all encounter, um, believe me, let's just park our ego outside for uh, the, the session. I'm not pointing a finger of accusation to anybody in particular, so please don't take any of these uh, indicators or any of these uh, observations about the industry personally. Let's just assume it doesn't apply to you. You're a consummate professional, but we're pointing out some of the uh, the mental issues uh, uh, or uh, speed bumps that uh, your competitors are suffering from, and you can uh, take it to your advantage accordingly and benefit. Now, this first little slide showing the success triangle, a, um, a team of industrial psychologists years ago studied the real estate industry in depth, uh, studying every aspect, every uh, dynamic to it. And they tabled a report, and even though it was years ago, uh, the fundamentals are still true to this day, as far as the uh, psychology of uh, the person who's in real estate. They're saying that there are only three key attributes or uh, dynamics that will make you successful in real estate sales. Now, normally with a live audience, uh, when I'm in a, at an event uh, in a hall, we debated back and forth, then we'll give you the answer. But I'm just going to show the answer right now. Kyle, the next slide, please. And then the next one, so all three are in, thank you. Now, please don't underestimate what you're looking at. This is of critical importance, okay? We all have our own little personality traits, uh, our own little talents and skills, but the fundamental truth is going to the core of the human condition. In commission sales, if you look at it this way, that it's in the shape of a triangle or a pyramid, attitude is the foundation, uh, shoring up the other two uh, uh, dynamics. Attitude is everything. Attitude prevails every waking moment of our existence. Okay. Now, the practical skills of how to sell. Now, they say skills or systems. Uh, it could be you have a host of systems that you employ on a consistent basis to generate uh, lead uh, leads and then uh, make commission income. So you have a cross-section of skills or you've learned skills and you have systems that you employ. And then the third part of the, uh, the trio is time management. Their experts are saying that if you have a positive attitude as a foundation, you have even a rudimentary understanding of the skills or systems of what to do on a weekly basis. And then with your time management, you are diligent and resolute about implementing or applying uh, the work plan, the, the ethic of it. You do it on a consistent basis and apply all the systems. You put these three traits together and you will be successful in spite of yourself. Now, the reason I say in spite of yourself you see, nobody comes into real estate. I mean, 
let's let's be brutally honest. It's not as if any individual goes, okay, uh, I'm going to make effective change. I'm leaving my job or my current uh, career. I'm swinging over to the arena of real estate. I'm going into real estate sales. And meanwhile, half the friends behind their their back say, oh, so now now she's trying real estate. You know, none of us go through this arduous process of taking all the courses, paying all the fees, the RICO, uh, you know, licensing, all of it to open our doors for business to then fail or to uh, capitulate and uh, acquiesce and give up on the endeavor. We all come in with good intentions and we know the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but we all come in with the anticipation of wanting to succeed. And I'll tell you, here's one of the first issues. Generally speaking, and there are exceptions to this, some people have a, a background in sales, but a lot of individuals who come into real estate as a career probably worked at a job prior to real estate at a job so you were probably in some accountable environment you had a list of duties to perform weekly you got paid your little paycheck every two weeks you were in a very an accountable environment where you very much had to answer to the hierarchy of command of to an immediate boss or supervisor sorry i'm getting a little feedback i don't know if you can correct that call but uh, it's, it's echoing on this end Guys, can you go on mute? Paymon and Amadi, can you go on mute? Okay, so if we come from an accountable environment where we answered to some uh, higher power of a supervisor boss and being in an accountable environment with a structure and a routine, you get into the habit of the routine of rolling along, performing said duties, collecting compensation and life continues. But to get to a point of critical judgment in your life, your career, to make effective change, you cast off the shackles of conformity, you swing over to this arena of real estate commission sales, where now you're uh, really self-employed, uh, you're running me incorporate under the auspices of this wonderful brokerage, international realty firm, but you're really a self-contained entity we're now being self-employed, you're allowed to do whatever the heck you want on a daily basis. So a lot of people find it jarring and unsettling um, and challenging to go from an accountable structured environment at their job to swing over to commission sales, where now it's such an open field, such a gray area, such a scope of uh, being allowed to do what you want on a daily basis, answering to no one, no accountability. It's pretty easy to slide off on tangents and uh, to waste a day in real estate sales. Uh, and then you get into the habit of that. You waste a day, then a, a week, then a year, then a career. This is why there's such a high attrition rate in our business. A lot of people think they're going to come in to try real estate, but ultimately it ends up that real estate tries them. And they come in with good intentions, cut their teeth on the business, fail abysmally, leave to be replaced by the next crop of new babies uh, coming in. Uh, really, to be blunt, uh, one of the reasons is that what they teach at the colleges, uh, used to be a RIA, now Humber. The, the challenge is that what they teach you to become licensed, uh, they teach a lot of information and uh, knowledge as to how to stay out of jail. They don't teach you how to make money. And that doesn't help matters. It's mostly academia. You uh, learn it, then uh, you pass the courses, then you quickly forget most of it. Uh, so this is why sales training sessions, et cetera, you should continue doing this, obviously, on a consistent basis. So. It's the individual who comes into real estate sales who has the rare breed who has the mental discipline, the business acumen, where we go out every day with our business plan, uh, we proactively are drumming up business, we encounter different issues, different uh, uh, aspects of life, uh, uh, distractions get in the way, they knock you off on tangents, but you have to have the wherewithal, the inner drive as you proceed to implement your business plan, if you get knocked off on tangents, which we all do, you get uh, distractions in life, you, can, you deal with the distraction in a resolute manner, di disciplined, determined manner, and then you swing, revert right back on track, uh, coming back to your uh, uh, blueprint or map for success to keep plowing along to um, accomplish uh, the, the tasks that you mapped out for the given day. It's, it begs the question, why is it such a rare trait for people to have that mental discipline, that, that type of business acumen, that type of uh, attitude to be able to, in a resolute manner, swing right back on track and to be persistent and pursuing uh, the goal that they want? Uh, now, next slide, please. And we just need all, yeah, the four will come through. Now, here's what holds people back. Okay, generally speaking, you've got fear of failure, fear of rejection, the unknown success. 
Okay, now here it is in a nutshell. First of all, the first one, fear of failure. Is it an understandable consideration? Of course, any, not just real estate, any walk of life, you, you could have uh, looking at attempting uh, some task or goal and you're afraid of failing. So you're hesitant uh, to proceed. But the interesting thing is people don't think it through. Let's say the next time you're faced with a task or some challenge that you know that's the right opportunity of where the commission money is. And because it's negatively charged for the environment, you're afraid of going down that path. You're afraid to step up to the plate to make the attempt. Well then, perversely, what's ironic about that is if you really in your heart of hearts are afraid of failing, and then you don't even take the path to make the attempt, then you have failed by your non-action. So ironically, your worst fear is realized. So, uh, you know, it's, it's rather ironic that people don't think it through. If you are looking at a short-term goal and there is the objective, the, the reward, and because of apprehension and uh, anxiety, and you're thinking, oh, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. Don't forget, anxiety is the interest paid on trouble before it's due. If you ever are anxious about any future issue and you're afraid to proceed, anxiety is the interest you're paying on trouble before it's even shown up. Half the time, it doesn't even uh, present itself. But if you don't even go down the path to make the attempt to step up to the plate to hit the ball, then you're not going to have any chance to hit the ball. So ironically, perversely, if you really are in your heart are afraid of failing, your worst fear has just been realized by your non-action. So please keep that in mind. Rejection, obviously, you know, in commission sales, it's a numbers game. There's no realtor in North America that has a thousand percent bat ratio. Even the top superstar um, teams and the top superstars in real estate, the stats show that they maybe have an 85% success rate, now, which is really impressive. Uh, that's really opting out and uh, maximizing your potential. But they don't get every piece of business they go after. So they bump their head on the ceiling of 85%. So rejection is just part of it. If you ever proactively go out and talk to any consumer or even through social media and you're interacting with some would-be possible client and you're just casting a big net of offering your service, it comes down to the rationale that if people are indifferent to it and just shrug it off, well, either the timing isn't right, you, you haven't be asking the right questions, offering your quality service to these people, but they're not interested of availing themselves at this time, no interest in buying or selling a piece of real estate, or they have a relationship with a realtor that's a bond that you can't break, or they have something else that they want to take another path. But you just recognize that as far as any type of rejection, you go by the sheer numbers of who you're talking to, you close a certain faction of it, and then you recognize that some will just drop by the wayside and you continue to move forward in a proactive fashion. Uh, so you temper your judgment with knowing that going into the environment, going into this scenario, that never mind the word rejection, there is a certain percentage where you're not just going to prevail and be able to shut it down and close. Now, the question is, if you want to sharpen your skills, where, for example, right now, let's say for every five appointments you go on, let's say you close two of the five. Well, then it begs the question, what do you need to sharpen your skills, the psychology of selling, knowing how to qualify any situation, build rapport with decision makers, paint benefit pictures, providing effective solutions to the, them where they perceive a, a benefit by working with you, and then knowing how to ask for the order, uh, the listing or the offer, whatever. You, ne you need to be able to ask in a low-key, understated, non-threatening, consultative manner. And if you have presented something beneficial that people perceive a value in, they perceive you as being a value to them and it's worth whatever you're quoting for commission, they will proceed if they perceive uh, and you ask in the right fashion. So it begs the question, can you hone and sharpen your sword where instead of two out of five, just to be able to uh, sharpen your instincts and your skills where maybe you can reach for the bar of, of closing three out of five. And of course your income would go up commensurately. You see, here's to cut to the chase. Here's um, the bottom line. Comparing the analogy to other professions. Now listen carefully to this, this makes an excellent point. Let's say you've got some people, uh, they, they go in to be, uh, become a doctor. And you see, the thing is, we going into real estate, we want to make the same money as doctors and lawyers. But listen to the path that they had to take. Someone going in to become a doctor, they go through all the years of schooling, university, the medical school. Uh, they go through an internship period at a hospital, brutal hours, not much compensation, very stressful. They go through that apprenticeship, finally uh, become a full-fledged MD. Then they build their uh, medical practice and very successful onward, having paid uh, the apprenticeship price. 
lawyers, lawyers, he or she, they'll go through all the uh, years of schooling, law school, articling period, uh, working at some firm, 80 hours a week, burning the midnight oil, very stressful, uh, almost nervous breakdown territory, finally called to the bar, full-fledged lawyer. Uh, they build their real estate practice, make a lot of money, very successful, having served the apprenticeship. We in real estate, we take some Mickey Mouse courses at Aria slash Humber, whatever. We hang out our shingle and we want to make the same big money, but we conveniently forget that we haven't served the apprenticeship like the other two uh, professions. Unless you have the luxury of being slotted in where you have a huge sphere of influence, where you're just fed leads and business, which is rare. You've won the lottery if you're in that situation. But if you have no choice but to serve the apprenticeship of the prospecting and being proactive, going out and pulling the business towards you, then that is an apprenticeship of sorts. So this is where it comes under this umbrella. You're facing up to the failure on occasion, rejection where it's a numbers game, looking for that faction wanting to take action with you and you get your victories. I mean, the fear of the unknown. Um, uh, think about unknown. Um, think back to the uh, comparison um, when we were in our teen years trying to learn to drive a car. We can all remember that day, first day behind the wheel of a car, or hunched over the wheel, our nose an inch away from the windshield, hunched over the wheel, driving very tentatively and thinking, I'll never get the hang of this. Now, all these years later, it's very simple to drive. Why? Because of just the practice re uh, rehearsal of the practice of driving a car. And now you are proficient, at least I assume you are. So as far as the unknown, is, it's things you can conquer and learn a new skill and embrace it and pick up the ball and run with it. Fear of success, I don't really want to dwell on that. Um, because I'd like to think that most people come into commission sales really aren't afraid of success. They're going for the brass ring. They're going for the gusto. Most people, to be uh, honest, who are afraid of success is usually because maybe if they've been born into impoverished, uh, humble beginnings uh, in a dysfunctional, caustic environment, negative programming by some authority figure, a parent, a teacher, some authoritative role model has drilled into the little computer of the brain. Uh, nothing worthwhile about you, useless, uh, you'll never amount to anything. And then these poor individuals growing up into young adults um, have low self-esteem issues and they don't tend to want to go for the brass ring. There are exceptions, but uh, they tend to take the path of least resistance and go and work at a job under someone's thumb, being paid a fraction of what they're actually worth. Uh, Thoreau was correct when he said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Let's update it. Most people lead lives of quiet desperation, just eking out a uh, uh, an income at a job being paid a fraction of the worth until the grave beckons, but it doesn't apply to us. Uh, I don't mean to wax too philosophical, but uh, that, that's all I'm going to say about being afraid of success. It doesn't apply to the current audience. You're all wanting to go for the gusto and maximize your uh, potential, so let's not dwell on that. But this is what you do. These four foibles, just recognize that under the umbrella of the apprenticeship, and generally speaking, it would be what Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote the book Outliers a number of years ago, best-selling book, where he talked about the 10,000 hours needed to be invested. So whatever occupation or industry you're in, the logic is you invest 10,000 hours of effort, of apprenticeship time, learning your craft. And whether it's a carpenter, whether it's a doctor, dentist, a realtor, a ditch digger, it doesn't matter. You, you, you invest 10,000 hours during this apprenticeship the first number of years. Now, when you think about working 40 hours a week, and I know some of you work 60, but just work with me here. Say in a typical uh, occupation or career, people put in a 40 hour week, 50 weeks to the year, say two weeks off. So 50 times 40 is 2000. 2000 hours of vested uh, effort uh, per year. Therefore to reach 10,000 hours would be five years. And that makes sense. Our instincts tell us that generally if you go into any occupation or, or a career, it probably takes about five full years to really become proficient, a so-called expert at it. After five years of full-time concerted effort and all the trials and tribulations and the wounds you've taken. See, it's a topsy-turvy roller coaster we have in real estate sales <clears throat> where in the first five years, you're learning your craft, you're cutting your teeth on the business, a lot of failure, a lot of rejection, spinning your wheels, ups and downs, topsy-turvy. Some days you feel frantically busy, other days you feel like you don't know what you're doing and the, the, what to, to do with the entire day. So you get jerked around by clientele, lied to, stabbed in the back by friends, you go with somebody else. So it's a real baptism of fire that you go through during this apprenticeship period. But if you can manage to prevail and stay the course, and learn from this arduous process, this exercise, that apprenticeship, and invest the 10,000 hours of this boot camp, then you surface as a full-fledged real estate marine, up and running, 
some foundation of income coming in per year, and then you're away to the races where your income goes up uh, commensurately for each successive year, and it won't be as hard ever after that. Uh, you'll have a much easier time. Uh, you've honed your muscles, you've sharpened your sword on that, that uh, military tour of the first few years in real estate, and then it puts you in good stead to be a, a full-fledged veteran six years onwards to be able to encounter any issue or any type of a scenario and you're well prepared with your arsenal of ammunition of uh, what you know to do in any type of difficult circumstance and then you just apply the answer and you get to keep your fair share of the commission income i mean the punchline is uh, as far as learning anything in life aristotle was right we learn by doing okay don't forget that we learn by doing next slide please Okay, self-discipline versus self-deception. Now this ties into avoidance behavior. We have social media, it's amazing. It's really transformed the world. Of, uh, you know, we, a lot of people rely on it. Uh, now, if you get all the leads you want from social media, that's fine. But generally speaking, uh, as far as doing other endeavors, it ties back to what I said before. You must be able to mentally be prepared to go out and proactively pull business towards you compared to just sitting there looking at the phone and saying, ring, damn you. No, the idea is you have to go out and be able to pull the business towards you, get enough numbers on the go of a stream of uh, activity and lead generation, and uh, be able to sniff over the dynamics and close a certain percentage of it. So please be careful of avoidance behavior, uh, filling up your day with non-threatening work. Uh, it begs the question, um, when I said social media, how many of us are always going back and checking it constantly, seeing, okay, now, you know, who's paying attention, who's in love with me now, uh, you know, how many likes are getting, et cetera. Uh, you know, how many times do you really need to check uh, such things, uh, whereas you should have your oar in the water of doing a host of other uh, initiatives while social media is just one of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the oars that you have in the water. So next slide, please. See, it's avoidance behavior for that. Now, Prospecting versus service. Uh, I gave ahead of time a copy of some neat little strategy ideas. Here's the list right here. Uh, I sent it to Kyle where he has now forwarded uh, to you. I'm not sure if we can get it up on the screen, but uh, it's got a, a host of different little ideas. Uh, it goes on, there must be 70 or 80 of them here about what you can do for on social media to keep yourself uh, interesting to uh, anybody looking at it. Uh, sharing farm area stats, your market stats, community events. Uh, you can ask people to sign up uh, for street match uh, if they want to be kept informed what's going on in their area. Uh, profile favorite local businesses. You can share a client story. The list goes on. There are a whole bunch of them here as far as for uh, your social media list to make you seem fresh and interesting. And it gives you a, a good piece of ammunition that should get you through each year and then repeat the process. Now, other than what's on that list, uh, the last time I was on with our group, and I'll mention it again, I know a lot of us are watching our budget. If you can manage to outsource a good, effective newsletter, okay, uh, there are plenty of good companies out there. You can outsource it where you get a nice, uh, very professional looking newsletter, your photo on a blurb, you can send electronically or to some small portion by snail mail if you'd like. But you have your sphere of influence. And if you really rack your brains and go through thinking of every person you've ever met, in your sphere of influence. The list usually is between 120, 150 names. I'm, about, I'm talking about the dry cleaner you go to on a regular basis. Uh, your cousin's next door neighbor you met at a barbecue a few times over the years. Uh, your hairdresser, your car mechanic, anybody, anybody that you've met that the rule of thumb is that if you were to send them a newsletter saying, would you like to get my newsletter here? I'll be glad to send it to you, keep you informed about real estate trends. Uh, you should be able to come up with about 120 to 150 uh, names and you should send that out monthly to them. And then in conjunction with that, uh, it's a little dry, but if you go to uh, Market Watch, uh, Market Watch from Treb, it's dry as dust, but it's dead accurate for the stats uh, for uh, market, uh, what's going on around GTA. You can send out Market Watch, and I think Market Watch comes out about the seventh of each month. So if you want to send out Market Watch to your collective sphere of influence or client base to keep them informed about what's going on for GTA, and then two weeks later, but the third week of the month, send out your beautiful professional newsletter. It's a great one-two punch in tandem every month. You're sending out the two items that are beneficial in connotation to the recipient. Now, that's the rule of thumb. Whenever you send out any type of uh, information or any contact with any of your sphere or, or client base, keep in mind the working rule of thumb is whatever you send, yes, it'd be electronic, 
But if you send anything electronically or it's out there on social media, it should be beneficial to the person looking at it on the screen or the recipient receiving it. It's, it's always what's in it for me. So if they receive any, if, if Joe Q public knows you even in a passing fashion, they know your name, they've met you and you send them uh, a newsletter all about things about the market and the economy and real estate trends and demographics and uh, graphs. Most people love all things pertaining to real estate. And if they receive it and they like what they're looking at, knowing it benefits them, it pads their own pocket. It takes the sting out of the contact taking place. So the one, two punch of the market stats and the, um, the newsletter, along with throughout the year, you want to send from this list of the 60 or 70 different ideas to intersperse it on social media. That brings you up to a certain number of touches. We call them touches where you keep reminding people of your existence. Now, not to scold or to slap on the wrist, but when I was here on a year ago uh, about the four pillars of income, I described that little uh, uh, system uh, to uh, uh, people on the call then. If anybody's here on the call now, I'm not going to point any fingers, but it begs the question, being a veteran trainer, I'd be curious, how many of you actually picked up the ball and ran with it and were really diligent and disciplined about doing the two contacts per month? And I would suspect that maybe out of everybody who heard the advice a year ago, some maybe never got around to doing it. Please, if you want to build a foundation, an empire of repeat referral business, it ends up that every person you meet, that there's even some semblance of a relationship with, and it's going to continue. Flag, uh, you have to with spam law, uh, legislation, just say, you know, can I send you this information that is wonderfully beneficial? Sure. You add them to the list. You want to finally build this rock solid foundation, uh, this, this empire of people you know, sending out so many touches per year so that you're a top of mind awareness. Uh, the comparison would be it's almost as if you're the little real estate expert sitting on their shoulder, whispering the sage advice in there saying, OK, here's everything, all, all issues about real estate, keeping you fully uh, advised uh, about what's going on so that, you know, as a consumer, you'll be fully informed. So if you're the little trusted advisor sitting on their shoulder, whispering the expert advice quietly in their ear and you're at top of mind awareness, if Mary, the realtor, keeps sending this information and it's every month, month in and month out, keeping in touch with them and sending them beneficial advice about all things real estate. Finally, after three years and two weeks, one of those people might think, oh, well, we want to sell our bungalow now. Well, better give Mary a call because Mary's the trusted advisor at the corner sitting there whispering in their ear all along. That's the trusted advisor. Just like if we think I have an accounting question, I'm going to call my accountant. Uh, I have a legal question, I'll call my lawyer. Uh, uh, you know, if I, same thing, it gets to a point where if any of your people that know you have a question, well, I'm going to call John, I'm going to call Harry, because you are the trusted advisor in the corner whispering this wonderful advice all along. So please uh, keep that in mind. Okay, now next slide, please. Persistence versus brilliance. Now, it could beg the question, if you were asked a question, what do you think is more important in real estate sales in the commission, in the arena of commission real estate? What's a more important trait to have being persistent at pursuing an endeavor or actual high uh, IQ, uh, you know, really brilliant uh, for skills. And the answer is of course, persistence. Uh, persistence is by far a more important trait or attribute to have than being, uh, have great skills or brilliance or high IQ. Uh, I've trained thousands of uh, people in real estate over the last three decades, all across Canada. And to put it in a blunt fashion, I meet some people where uh, you know, their head is in the clouds. They look down their nose in a denigrating fashion at any type of advice they're given about uh, the, being proactive and going out for the business. And they say, oh, how unseemly, how to say so there must be a better way to reinvent the wheel. And it ends up that every sand has to be in place on the Sahara before they're willing to make any calls. Whereas conversely, not faulting anybody, but uh, I've trained a lot of realtors, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, uh, you know, uh, uh, question about uh, does the elevator go to the top floor? But, uh, uh, but meanwhile, they're so dogmatic about chasing after goals and pursuing the endeavor and going after all the different tasks, like a dog with a bone, and they just won't give up and they keep pursuing the goal that they have in their mind. And they make a very handsome living. There are a lot of people with limited skills who have a great work ethic, great attitude, who keep uh, coordinated all the systems they need to do every week, who make a very handsome living uh, and make apologies to no one. So please keep that in mind, the persistence versus brilliance. Now, people have asked, what's a, do you have a first person example of this? Okay, I'll make, give you the short version. 
back when I first started training realtors here in Toronto in the 80s, uh, we were, I was the manager of a career development center of a major corporation. And we had uh, the career development program where it was known as the two-in-one, where all the brand new recruits out of college had to, starting with the company, work out of the brokerage, the career development training center. And they had to get two listings in one sale. Once any new recruit could get two listings in one sale, that would mean that they were up to speed, having learned the basic craft of it. And then we would just nudge them back to their home office of that company and the momentum would continue. So being known as the two-on-one program. And I'll never forget this as an illustration. Uh, I was teaching about 18 brand new realtors in a meeting room one morning there at Young and Davisville. And one of the 18 participants was a middle-aged uh, woman, a recent immigrant to Canada. She actually had a part-time job down, going downtown 4.30 every morning, cleaning the office bathrooms at Bay and King uh, in the office towers, and then come running up at 10 a.m. every morning into the training center, all out of breath, uh, now in real estate and wanting to listen to the training. And she couldn't speak three words of English. I'm not sure how she got her license back then in the 80s. It only took about eight weeks to get your license, but somehow she got her real estate license. But I'm not exaggerating. She could only speak about six words of uh, broken English. So we went through in the training center all about the role play of taking pamphlets, knocking on doors and chatting with people to see if they want to sell. Now talk about a baptism of fire. We took the 18 babies out on a school bus around lunchtime as part of the exercise. We drove to a side street in central court Toronto, mid Toronto. Uh, this is back when a lot of people were home during the week. And we had a little spy microphone that we hooked up to the lapel. There are only one microphone. They each had to share the spy microphone. So each of them had to take a turn hooking up the little battery uh, microphone on their lapel with the battery inside their jacket, take their pamphlets. And each uh, student had to get off the bus, go up and knock at doors. And we could hear transmitted on the speaker on the bus what happened at the door. So each of them were fumbling their way through it and just asking people if they want to sell. Now it got to be this woman, her turn. She grabbed her pamphlets, hooked up the little microphone, charged off the bus, went up to a house a few doors up the street, banged on the door aggressively. And the homeowner came to the door and we can hear it on the speaker on the bus. I was on the bus. I heard exactly what happened. Here's the following uh, uh, you know, discussion that took place. He opens the door and he goes, yes. And she mumbles to him and she patted her chest. She goes, realtor. Uh, and she pointed at his house. She goes, uh, sell, you want to sell? And he, he leaned forward a bit. We could see him. He, he couldn't quite hear. He says, what was that? And she goes, and she pointed again at how she goes, house, realtor, sell, sell. do you want to sell? Now, we can laugh about it and think, wow, you know, boy, that's going to be an uphill battle. But it ends up that that first year, this woman made the designation known as Leader Club with this company. Now, back in the 80s, Leader Club was where you made $45,000 in commission income, which back in the mid 80s, $45,000 was a pretty good uh, uh, strata to hit. Sounds like chump change now. Uh, actually, I, I taught this at a seminar before the pandemic in, in an audience, and I said 45. And one guy said, sounds like pretty good money now. I said, no. Well, anyway, she made a leader club designation, which was an accomplishment. And at the big Ontario convention where we're handing out uh, the plaques and the award certificates and taking photos with the vice president of the region, it's a big celebra celebratory event. And um, he meets her for the first time, shakes her hand, hands her the uh, little uh, plaque certificate. She mumbles hello to him. So after the event, he pulls me, the trainer, being the trainer behind the curtain, he goes, how did she manage to uh, make leader club? He says, she just works with her own ethnic community. He says, I couldn't understand a word she was saying. I said, no, that's not the answer. It ends up that she knows that her communication skills are so limited that she has such a burning desire to succeed that we've been tracking her efforts. She takes her little pamphlets and she goes out and she's knocking on uh, enough doors every day. She talks to 100 people every day in central Toronto not 100 doors and talks to 32 people. She would go out rain or shine, knocking on doors until her knuckles were bloody with the goal in mind that because she knew her message was so limited for English, she just felt she had to talk to a sheer volume of people to offset the fact that her message was limited. So she would not stop until she talked to 100 people face to face. And as she went through the arduous apprenticeship, her English got better. Uh, she still hit the same numbers and her income went, went up commensurately and she ended up leader club and went on to become a very successful agent. So talk about that burning desire of wanting to succeed. She was very limited for the ability or skill set, but she wasn't going to let it hold her back. Now, each of you listening today have a lot more going for you as far as your communication skills. So it's just a question of a numbers game. If you hit the proper numbers, you will succeed. Now, next slide, please. Okay, now. 
what if only. So what if only, uh, it comes, falls into two camps. It's funny how we mentally beat ourselves up on any endeavor, as I was saying earlier. The first one is what if, if you group those two words together, well, what if I knock at the door and uh, they reject me? What if I talk to that for sale by owner? What if I call this person and uh, they're really harsh with me? What if, what if, what if? So you fearfully anticipate, and don't forget uh, the acronym FEAR, F-E-A-R's, uh, false expectations appear real. So false expectations appear real. A lot of times it's the fear of it. So what if I do this? What if I do that? And you fearfully anticipate some future tense thing that hasn't transpired yet. And you beat yourself up mentally and you don't even uh, give it an attempt. The other half of it is if only grouping those two words together. Well, I would knock at that for sale by owner's door. If only I had learned the psychology of selling better. If only I knew the language skills of objection handling. If only I had a better presentation. If only, if only, if only hearkening back to lack of preparation, hearkening back to the past of not being prepared of doing the right things in the past. So the two camps are what if, what if, worrying about future tense which doesn't usually tend to come to pass most of the time. And if only, if only I were better prepared, hearkening back to lack of preparation in the past. And the operative word, the big stumbling block, the two letter stumbling block is the word if right there in the middle. Huge, uh, in, again, example, uh, I could describe any strategy or methodology to a, an audience where the clinical truth is it's 99% positive in connotation. I could describe some strategy or system that is 99% effective or impactful, very powerful. And yet you get somebody in the audience in their mind, they're going, well, that's all well and good, but what about that 1%? They, they hang their hat on the little 1% saying it's 99% effective. Yeah, but I bet you this would happen. And they really pick and gnaw away at the little 1% little negative foible to it. And they allow that to vanquish and make them fail because ultimately they don't have the gas tunnel fortitude to pursue it and make the attempt in the first place. And they, it's the old Zig Ziglar line, a famous trainer passed away a few years ago. He said, whenever somebody in real estate sales is failing and not making the commission income they want, they tend to point the finger of blame to the outside environment saying, well, I would make more money if it wasn't for the economy, if it wasn't for the market, if it wasn't for the pandemic, if it wasn't for these other issues, these other factors outside. And Ziglar said, keep in mind, as you're pointing the finger of blame at the outside environment, three times as many fingers are pointing back at the real source of the problem. Okay, so it's all in your mind as to market conditions. We can't change the market, but you can adapt and implement systems accordingly to offset whatever market conditions and adapt accordingly to crank out uh, uh, the good income. Next slide, please. Now, people are asking, gee, what's the difference between indifference versus ignorance? And uh, I had somebody in an audience once put up their hand and say, well, in one case, you don't care. And the other one, you don't know. And I thought that was quite brilliant to make that simple observation. Indifference, oh, you don't care. Ignorance, you just don't, you don't know, which is an interesting observation. But what we're getting at is that in the commission arena of real estate, it is so easy to be indifferent to some endeavor compared to actually tackling it, making the attempt, and then having to maybe admit your shortcoming saying, gee, I thought I could try this and I thought I might be good at it, but you know, I'm not very good at this. And it's very painful and arduous and I'm going through a lot of rejection and negativity and why did I ever even try this? And you have to admit that of your ignorance of saying, well, no, I'm not very good at this endeavor. I thought I'd have a certain innate talent, but I don't. So it's much easier to be indifferent to something compared to ignorance. Now, here's the example. You are all accustomed now, all these many years gone by that according to the TREB regulations, you're not allowed to approach expired listings because 99% of the time when it was currently listed on MLS, that owner of that property filling out all the documentation, the paperwork for the MLS uh, data sheet checked off that if this happens to expire this listing, I do not want to be approached by other companies. The purposes of this property going on MLS is for marketing the property, not for other companies to target me for their marketing. So 99% of all homeowners tend to check off, do not want to be approached. So according to the rules of TREB, you're not uh, supposed to approach expired listings uh, and could face a penalty accordingly. Now, many years ago, say 20 years ago, that wasn't a, they didn't have that rule in place. You could approach expiries. And what would happen is uh, a property would be on MLS for 90 days, expire on the 17th of the month. And on the, the 18th, suddenly 11 different realtors in the area would phone or knock at the door saying, would you like to hear about my services? And because of that harassment, they brought in the, the rules saying you can't do it anymore. But I remember clearly back 
when it first came in, all along you were allowed to approach expiries back then. Then they brought down uh, the rule saying, no, you can't do this. You drew a line of sand saying not allowed anymore. And the number of realtors sitting around having coffee at the brokerage saying, ah, uh, they changed the rules. Now you can't, you can't call expiries. And you'd look at that individual knowing their habits. You say, well, what? Like you were doing it all along, right? And they say, well, never mind that. But now you're not allowed to. Meanwhile, you, you, you tease them about it because you knew that they never approached expiries anyway. They were scared witless of doing it. They didn't want to have any rejection. But as soon as you told them they weren't allowed to do it, then they were outraged, shaking their fists at the heavens, saying, well, you're not allowed to approach expiries. Oh, that's, a, that's such a shame. Meanwhile, they're secretly happy that they're off the hook, that uh, it's no longer a prevalent category, and they don't have to admit that uh, they're afraid to approach it. But uh, they're, they're casting aspersions from the side out, saying, oh, well, too bad. Why'd you take it away from us? Meanwhile, they were too frightened and, and scared to approach it in the first place. So it was much easier to be indifferent to it compared to making the attempt and having to admit to their ignorance. Next slide, please. You see, proactive versus reactive. Okay, proactive, popular buzzword for the last 20 years or so. If you expand on the word proactive, it's, it means really in our case for our business, prospecting activity. Prospecting activity is being proactive versus reactive. You see, unlike a car salesperson who sits there at the dealership and the dealership has done all the marketing and bringing people to walk through the door who are already ready to buy a car, and then the car salesperson would have the would-be client customer step through the door into that environment, and then they could close. Then the, the salesperson could react to the captured uh, would-be client. Whereas in our case, you very much have to go out and pull the business towards you. Uh, you know, there's an old Mike Ferry line where he said, your job today is to go out and find somebody who wants to buy or sell a piece of real estate today. Okay, so you want to go out and talk to anybody who wants to buy or sell a piece of real estate today. And if they say no, maybe in a few months, then you add them on stream to uh, your contact management to keep in regular touch until they finally are ready. And by the way, just to share with you, if you're ever prospecting in a farm area and you meet a homeowner where they say, oh, we're not going to be selling now, but next spring we're planning on it. Don't make the mistake of some realtors who what they do is they say, oh, well, that's great. And then they, they follow up and send the occasional little newsletter or social media blurb saying, I'll, I'll talk to you closer to the spring. No, what you'd like to do instead is that if they these homeowners indicate that they want to sell come spring of the following calendar year, just say, well, I'd like to come over uh, time convenient to you, uh, Mr. Seller, just to see your property. I'd like to chat with you about my services. And if you can manage to go in and meet with them back when you first heard about the lead, and you know it's about a good five, six months before they're ready to sell. You want to make inroads of relationship building, uh, building rapport with them, showcasing your services, having them suitably impressed with your services, have a psychological bond saying, so when it comes springtime, I look forward to looking after your needs. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, keep in touch. And then there's a type of psychological connection, uh, tentative. Admittedly, there's nothing in writing, but at least you've built some rapport or semblance of a relationship, business relationship with these people. Then you keep in regular touch. Then in the spring, hopefully you would get the listing. Whereas up front in the fall, if you talk to them, say, we want to sell in the spring, and then you think, oh, I'll wait closer to spring to do my presentation. Well, all they've done is chat with you at the door for two minutes saying, oh, yeah. And then you, you send information over uh, uh, social media. No, that means any other realtor who happens to meet these people uh, during the span of in between of the five or six months who does uh, use their instincts to make inroads and build a, a relationship and showcase their services, they could build a stronger type of uh, bond with these people. And it ends up that you'll go by one day and see a competitor sign on the front lawn because uh, they were able to build that bond and bring it through to its conclusion compared to uh, uh, you who chatted with them for two minutes at the door back in the fall and said, oh, I'll keep in touch. And you just fire off the occasional little missive to them. No, try to make inroads and impress them with your services so that if anybody else comes along and chats with them, they say, well, thanks, but we've got a realtor. And then it's up to that other competitor to have the talent or skill to be able to uh, sever that bond and pull them uh, towards uh, them instead. Okay, next uh, next slide. Yeah, see, it's lead generation versus uh, service. Listings versus buyers. Now I could expound on this uh, for quite a while, a uh, short version. Here are the two factions that we have in our business. You get good, saleable, qualified listings. You work with good, serious, motivated buyers. 
here's the logic. You are self-employed, me incorporated. You are quite welcome to do a hybrid of working with these. Um, uh, I would suggest that the challenge is that a lot of people in real estate sales will spend an inordinate amount of their time and energy and effort working with buyers because they think it's an easier road to hoe. Buyers aren't that discerning about who they run with. Uh, if you've got a pulse, you fog up a mirror, great. Okay, yeah, if you're willing to you know, meet with me and show me properties, that's great. Okay, I'll work with you. And you're, a lot of people in real estate, especially when the first few years, you want to work with buyers compared to going after listings because listings, if you don't have much of a track record uh, to showcase and you feel you have to do a lot of prospecting and a lot of rejection to get leads, to get a listing. So a lot of realtors would take the path of least resistance and go with the buyers. Now, this is flawed logic and here's why. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the buyers have their place. But if we agree with the first working supposition that time is our most valuable commodity, time is the most valuable commodity we have in life. Irreplenishable, limited, life is short, death is long, okay, but time is our most valuable commodity. So it's even more important than health, okay? Time is all we have. Every nanosecond counts, especially if you're in commission sales. So if you are the listing agent, you get the stock on the shelf, the inventory, and you write out all the paperwork and marketing and you put it out there and you proffer it on the professional market. It's now on MLS, realtor.ca, the sign on the front lawn, social media, you're getting inquired. You're a high profile agent with your name up and lights in the areas and you've got the inventory, the bait, the stock on the shelf where you're getting inquiries, drawing attention towards you. In a very tight market, as we've seen over these last number of years, if there are a flurry of showings, and four offers come in uh, that same night, multiple offer situation, take a guess who knows they're getting paid that night, the listing agent, they're in the driver's seat. The other four uh, uh, buyer agents jump through the hoop, vying, jockeying for position, three get kicked in the teeth, one prevails and gets their part of the commission, the other three get kicked in the teeth, back to driving around people and uh, meeting them at houses again the next day, the journey continues, losing out on uh, offer situation after offer situation. When the property sells in two days for over asking, who has legal bragging rights to put in print and skywrite sold in two days for over asking price? You, the listing agent. Um, there are so many advantages. And yes, I'm even allowing for the little quiet secret that yes, I don't live in a fool's paradise. Even if you as a listing agent, when push comes to shove, if you have to take some bit of a hit on the chin that say normally you want two and a half percent, for your portion of the uh, commission compensation, offering 2.5 out on MLS, and you have to diminish it down to two to prevail and get the listing. So you took a bit of a hit on the commission schedule. By having a whole bunch of listings on the go out there, profit on the professional market, you're so whole pro high profile getting spillover business from it that more than offsets uh, the little bit of uh, tempering you did with going from 2.5 down to two. I'd rather get a whole flurry of twos then beat your brains out driving around like an unpaid chauffeur trying to piece together the occasional 2.5. This is why uh, I can prove it to you. Look at any superstar team in North America, superstar teams that you would know. You've got the figurehead, the top superstar agent with a team of agents you know, as part of their team. Well, any buyer lead that comes in is delegated to the minions who run the roads with the buyers. The top superstar, the figurehead, they go on every listing appointment and buy an offer presentation probably, but otherwise they're not going to waste a nanosecond of their most valuable commodity running around showing buyers properties. You are much better served by getting the listing of stock on the shelf to get all the additional spillover. You're a high profile agent from a marketing campaign where the people can see your inventory in the market area. Your name gets known over the years compared to running around with buyers showing them houses. It makes you pretty much a secret agent. Now, when the dust settles and you're not part of a team, and some of you say, well, I still have to work with buyers, Mike, to some degree, yes, but once you get your ducks in a row, here's my best suggestion. If time is your most valuable commodity, temper your judgment where devote 70%, seven tenths of your time and effort and toil to getting the listing inventory, 30%, three tenths of your campaign to working with good, serious, qualified buyers. And I can't stress that part strongly enough. Good, serious, motivated, qualified buyers. So anytime you're tempted to work with a buyer, knowing it's three-tenths of your business plan, really vet them, really qualify to the nth degree 
uh, scrubbing the lead to make sure that they're worth running with. And then on an, a selective or an exception basis, embrace those buyers and work with them. So seven tenths would be listing oriented, three tenths for the, uh, the buyers. Now, uh, next slide, please. See the buyers, it's known as the uh, Vegas syndrome. You can hit the, the jackpot, but the odds are against it. But yes, uh, you can run with them. You're like, everybody needs a hobby. Next slide, please. Okay, PLAPL, the acronym PLAPL, it means prospecting to get the lead, to get the appointment, to do a presentation, to get the listing. Now, this is from Mike Ferry. Now, Mike Ferry can be very aggressive on a lot of strategies, but this is a really good point he makes, okay? Look at the five parts of this puzzle. You prospect on a consistent basis to get lead generation, to hopefully orchestrate setting up an appointment, to then go and do a presentation to the decision maker or decision makers, single person, sole owner, or uh, partners who own it, to then hopefully procure the listing. And out of those five pieces of the puzzle, prospect, lead, appointment, presentation, listing, one of them tends to be the key uh, dynamic that uh, leads to the uh, failure or success uh, of the real estate practitioner. And if I ask an audience normally, which one of the five do you think it is? Prospect, lead, appointment, presentation, listing. Which one do you think is the linchpin, the key issue, the stumbling block of most realtors? A lot of us, after everything I've described today, would probably say, what, prospecting? And that would be a good guess. But actually, next slide, please. It's actually the presentation. You see, it's your listing presentation. Because let me just give you this example. Let's say Mary and John work at a brokerage together. They're not partners, but they know each other as colleagues at the same firm. And they're having a tea or a coffee one day, commiserating about business. And John says to Mary, Mary, we're having a confidential chat here. I, I've just wondered, uh, we're colleagues. Uh, if you had to assess your own listing presentation, what do you think? Is it, is it really dynamic? Is it scintillating? How good is your listing presentation by your own estimation? And Mary in private conversation with John, uh, sharing uh, little intimacies would say, what, my, my presentation? Yeah, it's okay. It's no great shakes. Uh, pretty average. I wouldn't brag about it, but yeah, I guess it's okay. And because Mary thinks her presentation is just okay, and it's not really impactful or really impressive, what does Mary do instinctively? She pulls her horns in. She isn't proactive by nature. She doesn't go out and do much prospecting because God forbid she gets a lead and an appointment. She might actually have to tell her story, and she knows it's going to get a lackluster reaction. Whereas conversely, if you thought you had this dazzling, dynamic, impactful presentation that was so beneficial in connotation that the decision makers at the end of your presentation are practically salivating, grabbing a pen and saying, where do I sign? Where you been all my life? Now I'm overstating to make a point. But if you knew you were going to get a positive reaction because you had such a great story to tell in your presentation, then it would give you the impetus the instinctive uh, desire to, you'd want to go out and get more feelers out there to get more prospect and go because you want leads in the door because you can't wait until you get an opportunity to go and tell this dazzling story knowing it's going to get a warm reaction. If you knew instinctively you were going to get a warm reaction most of the time or a positive reaction, it would give you the encouragement impetus to want to go out and lay the feelers out there to uh, grease the rails and get more business in the door because you can't wait to get to that setting to tell your story knowing it's going to be well received. So it begs the question, how good is your listing presentation? <coughs> now, I know some of you don't like the idea of um, learning language skills or pre-canned or memorized type of lingo. Next slide, please. But here's what it comes down to. Psychologists have determined, not just indigenous to real estate, uh, in our business, our industry, any walk of life, but here, let me share an example. Let's say you're doing an open house for the public back when we used to do it. And they may never come back after the pandemic, but just to sh illustrate, showcase this example. You're, you're a realtor conducting an open house prior to the pandemic. You put out all your marketing and signs out front and people walk in. Now they've never met you before. And when a consumer walks in and they meet you coming into the open house, hi, how are you? And you just chat for the first moment, uh, just nodding, smiling and saying hello and introduction say, yes, please look around. And then you start chatting with them. Within just a handful of seconds, they're gonna judge you by three factions. They're gonna judge you by your aesthetic appearance, your image. They judge you by your tone of your voice, uh, the timbre of your voice, inflection to the voice, and the words that come out of your mouth. You see, you're not showing them any visual aids. It's not as if you're bringing out a marketing brochure. That could come later. But right now in the first humble beginning stages, whenever you meet somebody at a cocktail party, 
oh, hi, how are you? My name is John, my name is Frank. And you chat with each other just for a few moments. You bring all your life experience to bear. You're not being judgmental, but you sniff over the dynamics based on the law of vibration. And you get just a gut instinct of who you think you're talking to. Not being judgmental, but you just, you know, you just get an instinct to feel about who you think you're talking to. And it's based on the aesthetic appearance of the image, the tone and the words. And if we can just slot in the numbers, remarkably, it ends up being that image is 55%. Next slide, please. 55% for image, 38 for tone, and the words only count for seven. Now, sorry, just go back one. <clears throat> now, look at this. Now, when you look at the breakdown of those numbers, some of you are thinking, well, gee, Mike, so much for your advice about, you know, you talk about pre-memorized language. If the words are only 7%, why would I bother memorizing uh, any objection handling or any language? Well, no, think of a chef. If a chef is cooking a recipe and they're following, you're following the ingredients and then you're off by 7% on one of the ingredients, the meal is going to taste pretty lousy. So each of these is of critical importance. Here's the analogy. For any of you who don't like, who just like to be your natural self and go on a, a listing presentation and just fly by the seat of your pants and hope for the best with the idea of getting the listing, I would suggest you rethink your position because I can tell you the top agents in North America have a good working knowledge of exactly what they want to do and what they want to say on that presentation. Think of it as a job interview. Think back right now to before you ever got into real estate, back when you probably worked in the private sector at a job. Well, going even further back in time, you probably had to go on a job interview to get said job. So the morning of the job interview, if it, if it was for a job of any importance, did you just wake up that morning, shower, put on business attire, and without any practice in your mind, just go in and just start ad-libbing your way through the interview? No, most of us for a private sector interview would anticipate at that point in time, what are certain key questions that are asked in a job interview? How would I couch my words? And you think ahead of time of how you would answer key questions, going over in your mind, practicing, so that you could then put your best foot forward on the interview and hopefully be called back to the shortlist and, and get the job of employment. So the 7% part is of critical importance if you have an idea of exactly how to couch your words. Once you've pre-memorized that part, it frees you up to look natural and self-assured and confident and authoritative and put your best foot forward. So uh, if you can memorize good language, and yes, a nice plug, I'd recommend my book is a bestseller for very empathetic and diplomatic language. Uh, you can order it through Treb or online at realestatelanguage.com, but you should have a good idea of the words of the 7%. Next slide, please. Okay, now, the I Ching philosophy. They use the same written character symbol for adversity as they do for opportunity. Think about that. That written character symbol represents adversity and opportunity, which seem to fly in the face of each other. They know in their, the philosophy, the I Ching philosophy, that the only way you get any benefit, the ripest fruit, the golden opportunities are where the most negative, caustic, harsh uh, realm is, because most other competitors would shy away from that harsh, challenging realm but you, if you can find the courage uh, to be able to prevail and make inroads to pursue the, the ripest fruit, that's where they lie within the harshest uh, environment. Here's the real estate analogy. I know most FISBOs for sale by owners are mere postings now, but picture that rare event where you're driving down the street and you see a for sale by owner sign. It's not with an agency relationship. They're just trying to sell uh, this property privately. So you get one realtor driving down the street, seeing a for sale by owner sign, and they think, oh, uh, oh, somebody wants to sell at that property. Oh, and they see the for sale by owner sign, which would represent that symbol you're looking at right now. And they go, oh, probably got a chip on their shoulder against realtors. Don't want to go on MLS. Don't want to pay the commission. Oh, they're probably really in lousy attitude. If I knock on the door, they're going to bark and scream and swear at me and challenge my family ancestry. Oh, no, I'm not going to go anywhere near this. And you continue driving down with your tail between your legs, not having the courage to face up to it. Ten minutes later, another realtor, a different realtor driving down the street, spots the same sign on that front lawn. And instead of seeing anything negative, that realtor with the good attitude mindset goes, hey, what a ripe opportunity. There's a consumer behind that door that wants to sell a piece of real estate. Yeah, they're trying to do it privately, but they haven't heard my services yet. So they stop the car, go up and bang on the door, at least stepping up the plate to make the attempt. Isn't it interesting? The exact same sign on the front lawn, one realtor going down, looked at that sign, saw nothing but negativity, harshness, drove away. The next realtor just saw ripe fruit, uh, uh, golden opportunity, there's a commission behind that door and they went for it. And yet, isn't it ironic that it's the exact same symbol on the front lawn? So please keep that little. Some people actually take this image and put it up at their work area. To, and as they're campaigning, 
uh, on their computer, they just keep remembering, okay, any harshness I made, there, there could be a golden opportunity uh, hiding behind there or hidden within the realm of that. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> okay, the gate of change. Next slide again, thanks. Only opens from the inside. Stephen Covey, the author of the book, uh, Seven Effective Habits, Highly Successful People, uh, you know, came out with this observation that if you ever wanna make effective change in life, the gate of change only opens from the inside. So you could have a support system around you of a spouse, a partner, children, you know, encouraging and uh, loving and supporting, but it's only where if you and your heart of hearts wanna make effective change to change a habit or some type of approach that you have in life, the gate of change only comes from the inside. So you can be cajoled and encouraged and pressured from the outside, but ultimately the gate of change only opens from the inside. Next slide, please. Now this study was done back in 2009, published in media, uh, where in two different universities, one in New York, one in Germany, they did the same type of uh, double blind study and they tabled the exact same uh, numbers. They got two groups of students, 20 students in each group. And the instructor said, okay, we want you each, each group of 20 to go after a goal. It's the same goal, same time limit, same deadline. You, the first group, go over in that room, close the door. You got pens and the paper, just strategize uh, in confidence and map out how to uh, go after the goal. So the 20 students went off. The remaining second group of 20 students, they said, okay, now the only difference with you, the second group, go in that other room, sit down with pad, paper, and pens. But when you map out the goal, which is the same goal as that your co competitors are going after, we want you to add just a, a couple of dynamics to it. Map out the goal of what you need to accomplish by that deadline, break it down into little mini goals of what you need to accomplish, delay the foundation, the building blocks to achieve the overall big goal. And then on each little mini block, work out how much time, how much money, and how much work or steps need to be taken in each of uh, the mini uh, blocks. Now, we've all heard about setting a big goal and breaking it down into little mini blocks to achieve it. But I'm challenging you today that when we leave here today, map out, not for the whole year, but even if from now, January 10th to say June 10th, from January 10th to June 10th, map out a credible, achievable goal that you have to stretch a bit for and lay that foundation. I like short-term goals that, how many little mini blocks do you need to lay down? If your close ratio is only a, per a certain percentage, map out, how many mini blocks of systems do you need to map out to lay the foundation to achieve the overall goal by June 10th? Now, back to the university study, by telling the second group to map out how much time, how much money, and how much work for each of the mini blocks, three times more successful at achieving the goal than the other team in the other room who are just left to free float and just to find their own way by instinct. So drawing that uh, advice to us, between now and June 10th, now, some of you out there listening right now set the world on fire, and what I'm about to suggest sounds like child's play. Others, it could be a struggle, but just as an illustration. So if you're really a big numbers hitter, you can, just, you can change the numbers accordingly to, to suit your needs. But what pops into my head is that in such a challenging market where short inventory, and I stress listings being the name of the game, if you could map out a goal between now and June 10th to you on your own, get six MLS listings. I could easily say 10, but I'm going to make it easy for you. If each of you got six MLS listings, good, saleable, motivated listings. And between now and then you got the six listings and you profit, put it out there on the market and you get all the spillover business from it, which would lead to at least another half dozen transaction past that. It'll lay a nice foundation for the first half of 2022. And from that, you can springboard off replicating it again for the remaining half and even up the bar, if you'd like, with what you've got for momentum or, or synergy from the first half. Now, some of you say six, cakewalk, Mike. Well, then fine, make it 16 if, that's what you've, if you've got enough systems in place. But some of you who are struggling, if you were to get six good saleable listings at the price point for Toronto, even taking it on the chin a bit for the commission, say 2%, but it gives you the ammunition, the inventory to draw more attention to you of spillover business. I think when the dust settles by the end of June for closings, you're going to have made some pretty nice coin. Okay, it's just an example. If you think it's too low, then just jack it up to a higher uh, volume of numbers. Just work it accordingly and then map out the strategies that you need to. Next slide, please. See, this is not a repetition. I know it's the same slide we started with, but it comes back to the punchline being, if you've got a good attitude, the skills of the systems of what to do, and then the time management of doing it consistently each week, like we've been describing over the last hour. 
if you map out a goal that's achievable, attainable, like I just described, which I think what I, I suggested to you is quite reasonable, and then come June 10th at midnight, you have not reached that goal, it begs the question why, if it was attainable and achievable, and you set the goal yourself for something you thought you could achieve, it ends up, we could debate this for a couple of minutes, but we're running out of time here. So it ends up, if you just click it again there, Kyle. Down there in the lower right-hand corner, it's an offshoot of attitude. The blunt truth is, ladies and gentlemen, if you set a goal for yourself with a deadline that is achievable, and then you in good faith tackle the, uh, the, uh, uh, the challenge, and then you get to the deadline, uh, and then you didn't uh, reach uh, the result that you set for yourself, the blunt truth is, I guess you just didn't want it badly enough. If you wanted it badly enough, you would find a way to do it. Okay, so that's the blunt truth. If it was attainable, now if it's something pie in the sky, then it could be debated. But if it's attainable, achievable, specific, you set the goal yourself for a certain number that you feel in your heart that you could achieve if you really put your mind to it. If your very life, if your very mortality mattered on it, you would find a way to do it. So isn't how you make a living and your livelihood and your reputation career, wanting to build a, a lifelong uh, reputation. Uh, I think this six month type of challenge isn't, shouldn't be that overwhelming. So uh, I would encourage you all to pick up and embrace it. Remember, a, a goal is simply a dream with a deadline to it. If you set that deadline of June 10th, it's a goal, it's a dream, it's an aspiration you have with a deadline. And I think what I've suggested for the six listings for anybody working full time, making a concerted effort is very much achievable and attainable. So I'll be glad now to answer, next slide, any questions that you have uh, and uh, address and expand on any of these points. Thank you. Great, thanks, Michael, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to spend another 20 minutes here. If anybody has any questions, and don't worry, no wrong questions, even if something subtle or some nuance uh, that you're concerned about, I will be glad to give you a so-called expert opinion. Yeah, just let us know in the, the chat section there, type in your questions and I can uh, <coughs> ask those to Michael. That'd be the easiest way to do it. Um, yeah, the, the fear of failure slide was, was, uh, was really good. Um, with the way that you were saying that anxiety causes us to miss the, uh, the taking action step, which is uh, kind of the most important one. Yeah, I think it's a great quote when you say anxiety is the interest paid on trouble before it's due. Uh, that's a, a little known quote, uh, but it's uh, very powerful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that goes with the persistence as well. If, you're, if you have too much anxiety, you're not going to be able to keep persistent. But other while we're waiting, Kyle, uh, Anything else pop into your mind that might be helpful for our group? Uh, I think the goal of six MLS listings uh, between now and June is, is more than achievable, do you not? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you can, a good goal is probably uh, one, one transaction per month is, is excellent to start. Yep. And, uh, and then, you know, from there, you might be uh, getting referrals and everything else. So it's going to go, it's going to grow from there. But yeah, good, good starting point, one per month. But I want to be clear to the group, as I said, if somebody is listening and you're creating you know, some very nice uh, revenue, uh, gross commission income now, then tweak and recalibrate the numbers that calibrate it where it would be that you're going to get, uh, you know, maybe uh, 12 or 15 listings while working with serious qualified buyers and working in conjunction. So just retweak it to whatever number seems to suit what you're currently achieving. Yeah, exactly. Um... The one thing I wanted to mention on the newsletter section that you were mentioning, sending out uh, market stats to your clients. Right. A good program you can use, which is free, is called MailChimp. So MailChimp.com. Yeah. And um, you know you'll be able to share your your newsletters that you create for your clients. You can just copy. Uh, we have Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we send out uh, the market stats every month from Treb, so you can actually take those. You can copy those and the graphics and everything, or you could reshare it on your social media. But what you can also do is take all of your clients' emails and their names, and put them into a database in MailChimp that's free, and you can send those out uh, monthly or, or bi-weekly if you like, and uh, it's a good way to keep in touch with everybody. And Kyle, as far as the uh, rather healthy list of social uh, media ideas, uh, I think uh, it's got some very interesting different uh, little suggestions there. Right, right. Right, I will send that to everybody as well. And uh, I have it actually here in the last slide, I think. Yeah, here it is. But it's not very organized, so it's hard to read. But I will send it to everybody in like a list form afterwards. Yeah, yeah, it's got a lot of great little uh, grassroots ideas of uh, what to send to keep yourself fresh and interesting and vary uh, the message of what you're sending them. But each of these little tips is beneficial in connotation. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so. Also, question. just to su oh, uh, suggest, I was going to suggest that uh, if there's enough interest, maybe in the near future, I think they'd benefit probably by us to go teaching a listing presentation. Yeah, absolutely. We should probably do this uh, at least on a monthly basis. So we'll yep. do like, uh, you know, something every month and uh, we, we would love to have you back if you're available and we'll, uh, we'll, go, we'll go and do that. Yeah, no, that's great. And you said you had a question in the meantime? Yeah, so Ali was asking um, if you had any motivational audiobooks or books that you recommend, other than your book, of course. I would, I would recommend Michael's book, and uh, I've actually had it a long time ago when I was uh, an, an agent um, doing just sales only, and uh, it's called Dialogues to Success, and you can get it on his website. It's called realestatelanguage.com. I'll type it in the comments. Here. But do you want any other books that you would recommend? Yeah, yeah. Uh... There are a few different ones. Uh, well, The Millionaire Agent uh, by Keller. Uh, Gary Keller is a good one. But here's a book, and I'd be interested, Kyle, if you've read it. It's been a bestseller for years. It's not a real, it's not a real estate book, but uh, I'm really impressed with a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. uh, I read it. I've read it three times now. And mm. I, I'll tell you something. Uh, I wish I'd read it. Uh, it's only been out for five, six years. I wish it had been published 20 years ago. It really will change how you approach, uh, how you work in life and having a host of systems to help facilitate uh, freeing up more quality time uh, just to enjoy life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it in that book, um, but there's another book I read is on the 80-20 rule. So like in terms of time management, you only have a certain amount of time every day. So there's uh, the 20 percent of things that you do are are valued at 80 uh, percent of the results you get. So uh, it's called Pareto's principle. So that's it's an interesting way to look at stuff as well. And he does address that in the book. So, yeah, it's a pretty much a universal theme. Uh, also, Ninja Selling is good. Um, Ninja Selling has some good uh, nuts and bolts advice. Right, right. Yeah, I read four hour work week a long time ago, many years ago. Yeah, uh, actually, they have, if you go they have a new edition now too, I think. Yeah, and if you, go back, if you go back and reread it, it's amazing how much you soak up that second time around. That's true. That's true. Yeah, great advice. Uh, and also, uh, outside of real estate, it's a classic. It's uh, the Bible of selling, the little red book of, sale, of sales. Uh, I forgot the author's name, but uh, it's talking about how to sell anything. And uh, it's, got, it's really a good template uh, for giving uh, good nuts and bolts advice, the little red book of selling. Nice. Yeah, another one I use too is Audible. So it's audible.com and it's through Amazon and you can listen to audiobooks while you're driving if you have long, long trips to go on or while you're at the gym or something, you can listen to books that way. It's Absolutely. Way to get your extra, extra books. Uh, someone's asking about outsourcing newsletters. So I, I mentioned MailChimp.com, but do you know of any other ones that uh, you recommend uh, for, well, for setting up the emails? Well, the best one that I've seen, and uh, I have no personal affiliation, but the top realtors I know, and I, I know a lot of top realtors throughout Toronto, and uh, it's called Clear Communications. And they only publish, I think, six per year, so it's bi-monthly. But the top people tend to send that one out. And uh, I don't think it's cheap, but it's really, really very professional for the content. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, MailChimp's a good one to get started. It's free, yep. and <clears throat> there's, there's a few paid options afterwards. That's good. Okay. And and market watch. Don't forget, it's arduous. But if you want to cut and paste and just send out for what's indigenous to their market area of W12 or C4, you can just showcase uh, what's going on for stats in their little area. Uh, and don't forget, when I talked about so many touches per year, I suggested a year ago this new strategy for every buyer you ever have for your career without you being asked. Starting now, uh, well, actually, it's interesting now in January is to send out an annual report to any buyer client you've ever had, a snapshot of what happened for the market on their street the previous calendar year. So send out to every buyer you've ever had an annual report every January saying, I want to give you your annual report of what happened uh, in your market area for the previous calendar year. And it, it keeps them apprised about probably the biggest investment they own. And just like we get uh, an annual report from our of, of our investment portfolio, uh, you're giving them an annual report, a snapshot of what's going on in the market area. And because it's an annual report, don't ever miss uh, a given year. You must publish it or, or send it to every buyer you've ever had uh, without fail. Uh, it must go out every January. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a great idea. Um, I, I've done that before in the past and you can you should name it annual report as well and make it official. 
um, you're basically like you're their real estate investment advisor, right? So exactly. Not, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it, it always comes out with, you know, one or two sales just from that one email, really. So it's really important to keep track of all of your clients, get, make a database and uh, save that to a file. And also, you know, within whatever email um, program you're using. See, the simple truth is, it comes down to a matter of elimination. If anybody listening right now, if you have a huge number in your sphere of influence, if you know a lot of people, then you can cultivate that. But if by chance you're like most of us, where when you start in real estate, you only have maybe 150 people in your sphere, just by definition, logic dictates, that means you must go out and meet a whole bunch of new people to offset the fact that you've only got a very limited sphere. Uh, so if it's a big number for your sphere, great, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. But if you've got a limited number, logic dictates you must cast a, a much bigger net out there to capture the attention. Now, Kyle, just to share with the group, uh, with social media, it's amazing, um, um, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, whatever, do you find that you can get a slew of leads coming in the door, but you really have to be diligent on scrubbing the quality of the lead? Yeah, it's uh, you get a, a large number of leads, but they're not always the greatest quality because they are contacting a bunch of other agents that are on social media as well. So uh, the key comes down to quick response. So the first one to respond to them um, can usually get their attention. And then, uh, you know, you have to keep following up. So Okay. And here's, here's another stat, which I'm confident none of you have ever heard. Okay. It's a little hidden fact. Now I know during the pandemic, it's hard to go out and see anybody face to face. But here is a very interesting uh, it's the distinction. If any consumer out there is thinking of maybe selling and they're out there on social media and looking at different websites and they have to click and fill in a field to put it in an inquiry, there's only a certain degree of motivation to interact with that field and to move the process forward. But a recent study shows that if you happen to have an opportunity as a realtor where you can look somebody right in the eye at some event, or you're talking to them in person, and you say, are you thinking of selling in their future? If they are tempted at all, you're asking them directly by the law of vibration, eyeball to eyeball, is 34 times more compelling for them to take action and answer in the affirmative, and then you get to move the process forward, compared to just sitting back and, and marketing yourself on social media and hoping somebody's gonna click and fill in fields and nibble. But imagine it's 34 times more persuasive and impactful if you ask them directly. Now, during a pandemic, yes, pretty darn impossible. But please keep that stat tucked in the back of your mind. The other thing is, I know you keep thinking, well, social media is everything, but, which is fine. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. But if they're going to, if a consumer reaches out to go doing their due diligence to sniff around looking for a realtor, they're going to contact probably three, five, six different companies and sniff over all of them. Whereas if you target your farm area where you get to talk to anybody in your farm area saying, I offer this service, are you thinking of selling in your future? If you offer your services on a platter directly to them, just at the time when they're thinking of doing it, the odds are many cases where they'll just take action with you and not even bother sniffing around to other companies, or at the very most, they might call maybe one or two other companies. So you have a one in three shot of getting it. But if you wait until the consumer of their own volition reach out to social media and start sniffing around to the entire world and, and around Toronto, you're going to be up against so much competition. Whereas if you can reverse it and go directly and ask if they're interested, then you might be in a field of one of one because, I mean, have you ever thought in your own personal life experience, have you ever encountered where somebody offered a service just as you needed it? And did we bother shopping around looking for others? like paving the driveway or the duct work or uh, fixing the screen doors. Now it's, it's, it's lesser compared to selling a house, but how many of us nibbled at that bait and booked the service without even shopping around to another company? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you can also pinpoint on uh, like Facebook and everything. Maybe I'll do some kind of a, a video on how to do this, but you can, you can market your um, advertising towards specific mm -hmm people in specific, specific neighborhoods and ages and yep. you know, everything. So you can, you can really pinpoint it down, which is uh, really recommended. Absolutely. But we have, we have a, a website company called Incom that we have a partnership with. They give us a discount if you're an international realty firm agent. So 
they can also set all that up for you if you're not really uh, into all the tech stuff and you just want to focus on selling. They can set up all of your social media advertising and uh, all that stuff for you. So let me know if you guys are interested in that one. Is there um, any any final question in chat? Someone was saying a listing presentation uh, seminar would be amazing. Do you, do you have a, something on a listing presentation, Michael? I do. I do. Uh... Okay. Uh, it's one of it's one of my more popular topics over the years. Uh, uh, it's usually a two hour session, but we can squeeze it into an hour and a bit uh, and I can give you the broad strokes of it. Absolutely. Okay, sure. And we have a, a template as well that I just shared in the chat for everyone. We have um, our own listing presentation in a PowerPoint uh, form, so you can use that as well when you're meeting with your clients. And maybe for the next seminar, we can either do something on prospecting or we can do the listing presentation one. I think probably I would think probably listing presentation uh, right now in the environment we're in, uh, we could do prospecting, but uh, <clears throat> I think uh, in, until they feel they've got a good story to tell, they may not yeah. be encouraged to want to do the prospecting. Okay, sounds good. Let's do a listing presentation next. So I think so. Next, next month. Sounds good. Okay. Um, and let me just see if there's another question here. <clears throat> Uh, oh yeah, Michelle Friedman is saying that he, he also has a book called The Star Agent Path uh, to 50 plus real estate agent transactions per year. That's also on amazon.ca, so that's a great book as well. I have that one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, yeah, look, people are asking for a list and presentation. So yeah, we'll, that's, that's, we'll do that next month. So um, I'll send out an email on the exact date and we'll figure that out and then we'll, we'll do that one next time. Uh, okay, let's do question. Do we miss Zach's question? Oh, the newsletter. Yeah, we, we already mentioned that one, uh, Ali. We, uh, we said MailChimp.com and then uh, Michael had a few other newsletters. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll do another one. Like also with the, with the prospecting um, seminar that we'll do later, we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail on some of the electronic prospecting and, and uh, newsletters and everything else. And another popular topic I teach is 50 uh, top sales tips. So uh, we could squeeze it into an hour and a bit. Uh, we'll go over 50 little uh, tips or strategies that'll help you make more money. Excellent. Okay. Thanks so much, Michael. And uh, thanks everybody for, for joining. And I'll, I'll, I'll make this as a recording as well for later. Okay. Thanks everyone. Best wishes and good hunting. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.